It has been my privilege to have shared with you over the past uh, two Sundays and again today. I have thoroughly enjoyed myself. You have a wonderful church. Your staff, Pastor Anthony, uh, Pastor Ezekiel, and Pastor Eli, and Pastor uh, Amanda, all of them have done, just been, made me feel, your board made me feel so welcome. I have really enjoyed being here. My name is uh, Vance Coffin. I'm the Executive Secretary of the Kansas District Assemblies of God. I've been doing that for 27 years. All that means is I'm old. That's all it means. I pastored Evangel Assembly of God in Wichita uh, for 35 years, and now my son is the pastor of that church in Wichita, and I'm Pastor Emeritus there. Pastor Emeritus means they want to honor you. They don't want to pay you. They just want to honor you, and you to keep doing all the things you were doing. That's what it means, <laughs> see? That's how they honor you. Just keep on doing what you want to do, you know. So, but. Uh, what a privilege it is to have this opportunity to, to be with you and to share with you. I have been blessed. You have all made me feel so wonderfully welcome, and it's just been fun. I've been sharing with you over the past two weeks, and again this morning I will, uh, some messages I've been just called my father. I've called him that. And the reason I've done this, I was thinking as I came here a couple of weeks ago, that it had been 55 years ago. 55 years ago on June the 17th of 1964 that my earthly father was killed in a tragic car train accident just north of Wichita. He was only 38 years old and I was 16 years old at the time. I remember that day like it were yesterday. I could, I could just walk you through that day as I lived it as a 16 year old boy. Uh, I was privileged to know my father for 16 years now. My father was a wonderful Christian man, both he and my mother. Uh, uh, my dad was very involved in my life, and I've shared a few things with you over the past couple of weeks that I have been here. Uh, when I was a small boy, I, I thought my dad was the, the, the bravest, strongest man there was on the face of the earth, and he could do anything. My dad could beat your dad, you know. I had that impression. My dad had been a gunnery uh, sergeant. He had been an artillery, in the artillery sergeant during World War II, and he had a squad of men, and he had an artillery piece, and they were involved in, in uh, the Army as it moved through Germany at the end of World War II, and he and his team moved through Germany as the war came to an end. And as I heard stories from the war and so forth when I was very small, I thought my dad was the bravest man of all. There wasn't anybody braver than he. And wow, he, he did this and he was involved in this. My dad also, when he was killed, had just about finished his doctorate in mathematics. He taught mathematics at Wichita State University and later in the public school system. And I, I, I just, I, I remember, I was so proud of him. He, he was the smartest man I knew. There wasn't a question that he couldn't answer. You, you can sense that I had a tremendous respect and honor, and uh, I have a great memory. I have privilege, now I know not all of you have the same uh, opportunity, but I have a great privilege of memory of my father and mother, Christian parents who raised me, because today I stand here before you as a product of their influence and their example and their teaching to me. But I didn't come to talk to you about my earthly father, I came to talk to you about my heavenly father. I've known him a little longer than I was privileged to know my earthly father, I came to know my Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, as my Savior. As a young boy at my mother's knee, she said, Son, do you want to accept Jesus? And I did. And my mother's knee at home, and she led me daily in, 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 in reading the Bible and devotions. I accepted Jesus, and I've walked with the Lord now probably almost 65 years, 60-some years with the Lord. And that relationship, that, that, that presence, that teaching, that help, that encouragement, that walk, as I've daily walked with him, I stand here as an, as an example of that walk and his love and his presence in my life. And I give my heavenly father the credit for what I am today as well as my earthly parents who taught me as a young boy. So today, again, on a third Sunday, and I, this is my privilege, I, I want to simply talk to you about my heavenly father and I want to brag on him. I want to brag on my father and tell you what a wonderful, wonderful Lord and God he is. Two weeks ago, I began, and I'm using Psalms 139 as the basis of what I want to share with you, 
For David talks about God in Psalms 139. If you have your Bibles, you can take them and look at this psalm with me as I talk a little bit about it today. Psalms 139 is 24 verses long, four stanzas or four paragraphs, of six verses each. And in each paragraph and in each stanza, David talks about a certain characteristic of God or his father and, and asks what is his relationship to him. In the very first stanza of Psalms 139, the first six verses of it, David asks the question, he says, God, do you understand me? Do you know how I feel? Do you know, know my problems? Do you, you know what I'm facing? God, do you know me? And he answered that question in the first six verses, and we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. He said, you have searched me, O Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my laying down. You're familiar with all my ways. God, you know me. And I talked with you a little bit about the fact that God knows you. My Father knows you better than you know yourself. He knows your possibilities. He knows what you can do. He knows what you could become. He knows your limitations. He knows what you could handle. And he's promised never to give you more than you can handle. And he knows better than you know today what you need. He knows. And if anybody in this place knows you today, my Father knows you. My Father knows you. In the second stanza, David asked the question, Well, God, will you be there for me when I need you? Will you be there for me when I need you? And in verses 7 through 12, he answers that question and he says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? Lord, you're always there. And I simply shared with you that my father has promised never to leave me. He's promised never to forsake me. I have this promise. I repeat it regularly. Last night in the middle of the night, our grandson, my grandchildren are with me and they were in the, the hotel one and he was having a coughing spell and just, just, just was coughing, couldn't sleep. He's three years old, couldn't sleep. And I, I was just laying there, so he was coughing. I said, Father, touch, touch Winston, touch him, Lord. My wife was up trying to tend to him. Lord, let Linda be able to go back to sleep and sleep. And as I prayed and talked, you know what? He'd been coughing for about an hour. Within a few minutes, he stopped coughing and fell back to sleep. You see, my father is there. I believe that with all my heart. Now, folks, I don't know. You, you may say that preacher that was up here, he doesn't know much. But let me tell you something. I know my father is with me. No matter where I'm at, no matter where I go, no matter what I do, he's there and he knows my needs. Today, I want to look at the third paragraph in, 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 or the third stanza of Psalms 139. And in this paragraph, David simply asked the question. And I've lost my notes there. There. David simply asked the question, God, you may know me, and you may be with me, but God, can you help me in the difficult situations I face? God, can you do something when the doctor says there's nothing that can be done? God, can you do something when I get that pink slip and, and I've lost my job? God, when I can't pay the bills? God, what can you help me in situations that are desperate and hopeless to me? God, can you help me? And as David contemplates that question that all of us have asked, we've asked, Lord, can you help me when I'm in a situation like that? David begins to realize that, you know, God, you created me. God, you, you made me. You gave me life itself. And God, if you can give me life, then God, I believe you can do anything. And listen, in verses, starting in verse 13, what David says here, he writes this. He says, God, you know, you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know them full well. My frame was knit, was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. God, you created me. God, you gave me life. God, you made everything that is. God, if you can do that, then God, you can do anything.
listen to this. I, I, I read this, and let me just read it to you. Do you realize that in a speck of watery material smaller than the dot over a printed eye, right here on my, smaller than the dot over the eye, all the future characteristics of a child are programmed. The color of his skin, the color of his eyes, his hair, the shape of his facial features, the natural abilities he will have, all that a child will physically and mentally be is contained in that germ form in that fertilized egg. From it will develop 60 trillion, 60 trillion cells, 100,000 miles of nerve fiber, 60,000 miles of vessels carrying blood around the body, 250 the bones to say nothing of joints, ligaments, muscles, and life itself is all contained in a speck of watery material no bigger than the dot on a printed page. My God created life itself. My God created me. And if my God can do that, my God can do anything. When you begin to think of that, you begin to realize this simple truth that my Father is omnipotent. Now I know that's a big word. It simply means He can do anything. My Father can do anything. He is omnipotent. And I realize today that some of you, even in this place, in a crowd this size, you you face situations that don't seem to have answers and seem to be impossible and you don't know what you're going to do. And I have a word for you today. My father who knows me, my father who's with me, can do anything. You know, when I, I read through the Bible and I read the stories of the Bible, I, I read people who face impossible situations and, and didn't know what they were going to do. Remember the story of Jairus, the, the, the ruler who came to Jesus. Jesus, would you come and heal my daughter? She's at the point of death. And Jesus said, I'll come, Jairus. I'll come and heal your daughter. And on the way, a woman with the issue of blood, a little woman who was sick, pushed through the crowd, touched the hem of his garment, and she was healed. And Jesus stopped to minister to that woman. In that moment, she was healed. And while he was doing that, the, the servants from Jairus' house came and said, Jairus, it's okay. Don't bother Jesus any longer. It's too late. Your daughter died this morning. It's, it's over. Jairus, I'm sorry. It's too late. And when Jesus heard the message of the servants to Jairus, he simply turned and looked at him and said, Jairus, just believe. Just believe. And Jairus did. And Jesus went to his house, and Jesus raised the little girl from the dead. Remember when Jesus went to the pool of Bethesda and found a man there who'd been there for 38 years? He'd been lame. For 38 years. In the story, when an angel in the Bible, when, when the waters was stirred, the, fir stirred, the first one in was healed. But this man had been there 38. He couldn't, he didn't have anybody to put him in. He couldn't get in. Jesus came and said, do you want to be healed? He says, uh, well, Jesus, I, I've been here for 38 years. I've been over here half my life. I've been laying right here, and I haven't been able to get in the water and be healed. It's, it's really probably over for me. There's nothing that can be done. I can't. Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. Take up your bed and walk. And the man got up and walked. You remember the day in Bethany, in front of the grave, when Mary and Martha said to Jesus, Jesus, if only you'd have been here four days ago. We believe that you can do anything. We, we, we believe you could have healed our brother if you'd have been here four days ago. But four days ago, he died. We wrapped him in cloths and buried him in the tomb, and he's been there for four days. Jesus, if only you'd have been here four days ago. If only you'd have been here. And it says Jesus wept. And you know what he said next? He said, Lazarus, come forth. Move the stone. And out of the grave walked a man wrapped in, in strips of cloth that had been buried four days ago. And even his sister said had begun to stink, begun to deteriorate, and he walked out alive. Let me tell you, my friend, my father does not know impossible situations. My father, my father can do anything. And the things that men think are impossible, Jesus can do. Now, listen to this verse. You, need to, you just need to focus on this. I need to get this in your mind. It's Luke 18.27. Luke 18.27 says this. The things which are impossible with men are what? Oh, you're better than first service. You're good. 
The things that are impossible with men are what? Who said that? Jesus. It's in the Word. The things that are impossible with men are possible with God. Now, Mark 9, 23, one more. It says this. If you can, Jesus said, everything is possible to him who believes. How much is possible to him who believes? How much? How, the word, what does the word everything mean? Does it mean most? It means everything. It means all. What is impossible to man is possible with God. If you can believe, everything is possible with God. Now, I've thrown around a couple of words here quite a bit. The word impossible. If I say the word impossible, what do you think of? It can't be done. It's not in our realm of ability. With human beings, we are finite. We are limited. There's a lot of things that are impossible for us to do because we're just human beings. We understand that. It can't be done. That's impossible. But when I say this, with God, nothing is impossible. God can do everything. What do you think of? My father does not know the word impossible. For my father can do anything. There is nothing that he cannot do. For my father, what is called impossible is totally possible. Now, I want to just take four illustrations for you today. And I'm trying to convince you. I, I know you know this but I'm reminding you and driving it home into your hearts. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Take, for instance, sickness, disease. Sickness, physical infirmity. What was the most devastating disease in the Bible? Leprosy. Leprosy had no cure. When you were leprous, they cast you out of the, the fellowship of the city. You had to go outside because your body would continue to deteriorate and, and in leprosy would destroy your skin and your body and you would die. There was no cure for leprosy. A leper, bold enough to come up to Jesus, said, Jesus, I know you can heal me if you will. What did Jesus say to him? I will. He touched that leper and he was healed. The man with the incurable disease of the day was healed by Jesus. And the leper was cleansed. At one point, ten lepers. Now, Jesus just wanted to show you that healing the impossible disease once, that's a big deal. But ten lepers came to him, and Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priest. How many of those ten were healed? All of them. The most impossible disease of the day, not only was one man healed when Jesus touched him, but when ten of them came, every one of them was healed as Jesus, he didn't touch them. He just said, go, and they were healed. The most impossible diseases of the day, Jesus healed. How about... Um, blindness or deafness. If, if you lose your sight, if you lose your hearing, it's pretty hard in the human to get those things back, right? A person born blind or a person that's born deaf, it's pretty difficult medically and in, in, in ability. What did Jesus do with blind people and deaf people when he encountered them? He opened blind eyes. He opened and unstopped deaf ears and they could see and they could hear. The things that men think are impossible are totally possible to God. Do not tell me when you hear words like cancer, AIDS, stroke, Alzheimer's, do not tell me those things. Well, Pastor, I, the doctor said there's nothing that can be done. It's over. I'm sorry that, that medically there's just, it's, it's, I'm, on a, I, I'm on limit. Don't tell me those things are impossible. They may be with man, but with my father, the things that are thought impossible with men are totally possible with God. My father has provided through his son Jesus on the cross. He bore his stripes that I might be healed, and I am healed today because my father can do anything. All right. What about impossible situations? Now, I know some of you in this room, an audience this size, there are somebody in this place that's facing something that you think is impossible, whether it's a financial situation, whether it's a job situation, family situation, whatever it might. It may be a spiritual situation you're facing and you think that that situation is impossible. But you know what? My father does not know impossible situations. He does not know. Desperate situations are totally possible with my God. What about the time Jesus was preaching to the crowds? 5,000 men plus women plus children. Let's say there's 10,000 people. I don't know how many. Let's say 15,000 people. And Jesus said to his disciples, we need to feed them. What did the disciples say? Can't be done. 
McDonald's does not have that many burgers, Jesus. There is no food in this wilderness area. On top of that, if there was food out here, we don't have enough money to buy it for Jesus, that's impossible. You know what Jesus said when they said that was an impossible situation? You know what Jesus said? Sit them down. Sit them down. And he took a little boy's lunch of five loaves and two fishes, and what did he do? He fed them all. What the disciples said was an impossible situation and could not be done because there wasn't enough money and there wasn't enough resources. Jesus set them down and took five loaves and two fishes and fed every one of them. And you know how much they had left over? Twelve baskets. They had like, I mean, leftovers. They had dinner for tomorrow. What Jesus can, what men say is impossible, to Jesus, nothing is impossible. What about the time he was in the boat and the, on, and the storm came up on the Sea of Galilee and those disciples said, we're going to die, we're going to die. Jesus stood up, stop, he said, and even nature stopped for Jesus Christ. What men think are impossible are totally possible with God. My friend, I'm telling you this morning, my dad, and I say that respectfully, I do not say that flippantly, my father, my heavenly father, and I have a close relationship. I talk to him every day, and he walks with me every day. He loves me that much. He has picked me up a million times when I've stumbled and fallen. He has picked me up when I have failed miserably. He has been there for me, and he loves me more today, and I speak respectfully. I speak out of all the love I have. But my dad, my father, my heavenly father, my Abba father can do anything. There's not a desperate situation. All right. I keep thinking, what, what about man's depravity? What a, have you ever said the thing, that person will never change? You ever, you ever heard that phrase? Well, they, that person's been that way forever. But what we consider when people can't change, Jesus says it is totally possible for them to change. Uh, how about the woman? Remember the story of the woman caught in the very act of adultery? Remember the, the, the religious leaders brought her, threw her at the feet of Jesus and said, all right, Jesus, we caught her in the very act of adultery. What are you going to do with her? You know what the law says. It says when you're guilty, you were caught in the act, it says you should be stoned to death for the act of adultery. Jesus begins to write in the, the, the sand or the ground, looks up and says, you without sin cast the first stone. The people begin to leave. And then he looks at this little woman. He says, he says woman, where are your accusers? And she says, well, uh, Jesus, they're, they're gone. And Jesus looks her right in the face and he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I give you a second chance. You were on the way for stoning. You had been caught in the very act of adultery. But I give you a second chance to change your life and make something out of it. Don't tell me there's no hopeless situation with people. Remember the, remember the man named Zacchaeus? He was the tax collector in Jericho. He was the most hated man in the city. He cheated the people on taxes. He collected taxes for the Romans and everyone. People says, that man, they would spit when they heard Zacchaeus was coming. And that said, that man will never change. He is the most evil, wicked man of all. But Jesus walked by one day, and Zacchaeus was up in a tree to try to see him. And he said, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm coming to your house for lunch. And Jesus stopped for Zacchaeus and said, I know you need forgiveness. And today, Zacchaeus... Salvation has come to your house, and I forgive you. And Zacchaeus was a changed man, and he gave back what he had stolen four times, the Bible says. And the very man in the city that everyone said would never change and was a hopeless situation, when he met my father, was changed. So don't tell me that that drunk laying in the gutter will never change. Don't you tell me that drug addict out there can never change. Don't you tell me that person has sinned too much and he's gone too far. Don't you tell me that because with my father, anything is impossible or possible. Nothing we call, what we call impossible is totally possible with him. I'm trying to simply say to you today that there is not a situation that is a, a, a there that cannot be changed with my father. All right, I give you one more. What is the ultimate impossible thing? What is the ultimate thing? There are two things we face. Taxes and death's pretty final, isn't it? I mean, when you're dead, you're dead. Okay, we all realize that. Well, Pastor, ha, that's a good one. Death's, that's, death's impossible. There's nothing you can do when people die. Pete, uh, you're, you're, you're over. Remember the story I just told you about Lazarus in the tomb four days? 
Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And even the dead came back to life for Jesus. Even death is, is possible. Life is possible with my father. The widow taking her son, the widow of Nain taking her son to the graveyard. Jesus stopped and touched the briar and took his hand and life came back to him. How about Jesus himself? Died on the cross, put in the grave, three days, the tomb sealed by the Roman government, guards out front, and on the third day, Jesus arose from the grave. Even death has been conquered by my Father. My Father, even death, is possible. Life is possible with him. Everything is possible with my Father. So this morning, Here's my ultimate challenge to you. Now, I'm going to say something, and I don't say it to be offensive, but I dare you. I double dare you to think of the most impossible thing you face, the most impossible thing you face. And I want you to hold it up right here. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's a son or a daughter. Maybe it's a job. Maybe, maybe it's a habit that has bound you for years the most impossible thing you face. I, I double dare you to just hold it right there. Everybody's holding something different. And then I ask you to measure it against my Father, Jesus Christ. Jesus and my Father are one. They are in one. I ask you to measure it against him. And I'm here to tell you, when you hold up what you think is impossible and measure it against Jesus, you realize that with Jesus, all things are possible. For what you consider to be impossible, it may be sickness. The doctors may have told you you've got six months to live. The doctors have told you there's nothing they can do. Let me tell you, physical illness, I have seen with my own eyes. I have witnessed with my own life people who have come to the altar and Jesus has touched them and their lives have been changed. They've been healed. I've seen physical healing with my own I know it's true and I believe it with all of my heart. I don't care if you're facing a desperate situation. I, I have laid awake all night long praying in situations, God, you've got to help me. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't, and I have watched God change circumstances and meet my need in the moment I needed it. I am telling you, whatever the situation is, God is bigger. My God can do anything. I, I, and, and let me tell you, I, I, there's a man in our church that... His, his wife left him uh, many years ago and divorced. And he walked into our church one day, a broken man. He was, he was, he'd lost everything. And that day he came to the altar. Today, it's been about 10, 15 years. I, every time I see him, I say, you're a walking miracle because God has changed his life, put his life back together. And today, he is, he is, he is a greater, more abundant man than ever before because God can do anything. So I simply ask you this morning, what do you face? What's your impossible situation? And if you measure it and lift it up beside Jesus Christ, you will find that all things are possible. I leave you these verses. Mark 9, 23, Jesus said, everything is possible to him who believes. Or what he said in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. It will move. Nothing will be impossible to you. So let me simply say to you today, the things which are impossible with man are totally possible with God. For my Father can do anything. The world will tell you it can't be done. Don't believe them. For my dad, my father, can do anything. And he loves you. And he loves you. And he loves you. And he loves you. And he wants to touch your life today. Will you bow your heads with me, please? Just bow your heads. Heavenly Father.